So could you please state your full name? Raymond James Yellowney. And uh, where were you born? I was born in a bush, actually, in north of Wawiska. Uh, it was a homestead, uh, family homestead. Okay. And uh, when you were young, what did your, um, your parents do? My dad was a trapper, and that's what it says in my birth certificate. And my mom was a homemaker for the first part. Okay. And uh, you as a child, what were your interests or what did, what, what, what did you do to pass the time? Um, thinking about that, uh, it was before I went to school, uh, living in the bush like that, I, my activities were traditional activities, you know, hunting with my dad or, or canoeing or um, going on a little trap line with my, my grandmother. All those things kids did then, uh, I did. And then when I started school, we moved to the community of Wabiska. And there's the normal uh, going to school. Well, we had to walk across the lake to get to the school. So in the winter anyway, mm -hmm. in the summer, it's going all the way around the bay. But um, the activities were basically, uh, for me being the oldest, <laughs> I had a lot of uh, responsibility, even though I was like eight, nine years old. My younger brothers uh, were too young. They didn't right. have to do anything. Did you? I uh... <laughs> was going to school. After, after school, I'd run my little trap line near home, you know, being the provider, the oldest boy. My dad was working full time, so I, my activities were not the same as other kids in my age. They they didn't have to do these chores. Um, so I usually am doing things to, to sell, help support the family. Okay. And um, like in a lot of families, I imagine being the eldest, you also had to eventually maybe help with the other kids, help raise the siblings or... Yeah, it was my role. I guess my dad taught me. So my my role was then to to teach my brother, uh, the others were sisters. And so towards like um, in my teens, and it was, I was more involved in going to school, you know, finishing high school. So my role ended there. It was up to my dad then to teach the other ones who were not really willing to learn. So I guess it stopped with me and my younger brother who I was training and who I helped, uh, you know, do stuff that I did. Okay. And uh, what about school? When you started going to school, what, um, I guess, what were your strengths or what were your interests? Going to school, um, it was at a time when the residential schools were in operation, and but I didn't, uh, we didn't have to attend residential school. We were uh, Métis at the time, or non-treaty. And uh, so we, we were like day school students, but we still had to follow the same rules. Um, so it was uh, actually pretty difficult because I didn't uh, know a word of English when I started school. So all that you have to learn, and we weren't allowed to speak Cree anyway uh, at the schoolyard. So we we sort of, from there, uh, during, the, during the school years, my sort of my whole life was, uh, you know, going to school not really with a career in mind. Um, I guess towards my high school years, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. There was no career planning. Uh, the only people, white people I saw were the forest warden and the priest. And by then I definitely didn't want to be a priest. Yeah. So it became, uh, my first goal was to be a forest ranger. And, uh, but as, I finished grade 12 and I realized my math mark wasn't high enough and I hated math. So I gave that idea up and went into something else. Okay. And which was? Which was uh, recreation. I wanted something that I can come back home and work. Uh, and there was no one doing recreation. So I, uh, I went to Lethbridge after I finished grade 12 here in the city. I went to Lethbridge and took uh, outdoor recreation and conservation education. Sort of two possibilities there for jobs, right? One is recreation, being a recreation consultant or recreation director. 
the other one is getting involved in the environment, which sort of later in the years became part of what I did with uh, with the work that I did with the band and with uh, La Racina. Okay. So what would you consider to be your first official job? Well, in the first job that I had, you know, after I finished uh, that college uh, right. training, I was uh, hired by the government. And uh, and I guess that it was, uh, I was, my job was to work with all the isolated communities, including Wabiska, where, where I was from. And uh, there was seven of them all together. And it was to try to promote recreation programming and trying to get them in, in, in encouraging them to develop recreation, uh, recreation committees, uh, recreation boards. And uh, recreation was always last on the list when, you know, you have housing needs, you have employment, you have social, social problem, problems. And uh, by the time they got to me, it was 10 or 11 at night, everybody wants to go home. So there was never an opportunity. So the only way was to do that during the day, you know, go meet with people and try to gather interest. And it was difficult to do that and definitely not successful because uh, even today there's no recreation uh, committees. There's just each community has their own person who does you know, the hockey. Uh, there's no minor baseball, but at least there's some hockey uh, being played and facilities are built, all those things are. So recreation was something I sort of did for seven years and I backed out and went into something else, a different career altogether. And um, this was in Edmonton where you worked or? I was uh, in Wabiska. Okay, so it was in Wabiska. And then I, uh, I, my first job was in Slave Lake and Slave Lake was a special area in those days. It was the early times with the oil and gas there. Um, Slave Lake was a boom town and the government had a, had put some money in to, to create a special area where there's all kinds of programming, including recreation. And I was one of the recreation people and we covered, I think it was a group of us, a team. And um, after that, uh, the special area ended, uh, the funding ended and and everybody went their own way, but I stayed on as a government representative for recreation. And that to me was not productive because I I was not trained at the university like they were. And was my, my goals were not there. My interests were no longer there. So I went into something else. Okay. Which was? Well, I, I was at a crossroads for a while. I, I tried trapping for the first time. Uh, one winter, and I, I did pretty good. I was learning from my dad and also from other elders. And uh, that really was a good feeling, you know, working all day, you're running, there was no skidoos uh, or anything. You, you just had to run. So I used to run pretty 15, maybe 15 miles, you know, all together there and back. And you leave at eight in the morning and you're back at four it just was getting dark so it's, it's a good feeling you know you get to good in shape i i lost 20 pounds in two weeks yeah no kidding you know That's just right. from that and uh very satisfying and uh following that i i uh i really um uh, needed to make some money so i went in the rigs for a while worked one winter in the rigs and that was uh my first experience in, in oil and being always asking questions of the people I was working with were not interested in teaching me. So I was more there to just to make money, not really, they wouldn't teach me any more than that. I was a roughneck, what they call the person who does the work. So after one winter, that was it. Uh, what were your thoughts, uh, your first impressions of uh working in the oil fields? Um, I really, I was really uh, amazed at the amount of drug and alcohol abuse happening. You know, I, there was lots of incidents. And in those days, there was no such thing as safety. Uh, people hung over or stoned would be out there working alongside me. And I didn't do that. I didn't do drugs or anything. So I didn't fit in. Uh, but it was I was there for the money, and uh, it was good money then. 
and uh, and then following that, I went into uh, the, we had an old friend at an organization out of Toronto called uh, Frontiers Foundation. It was a volunteer organization. They they uh, well, recruited people from third world countries, mostly students, university students, and brought them over for the summer to work on projects in the Aboriginal communities. And most of them were housing, which was, I guess, uh, the biggest need our people had in, in Canada. <clears throat> and uh, so I looked after Alberta and uh, Northwest Territories. And that was, I did that for seven years, more or less, more or less lining up projects and and uh, finding money from governments to, to pay for the cost of the volunteers. And it was very uh, rewarding, you know, when uh, you get, you're dealing with people from uh, at any given time, maybe 30 different nationalities. A lot of African people, Germany, Germans, uh, English, Chinese, uh, India, Pakistan, from all over. Uh, and uh, they mix with our people and sort of my role was to sort of become like a cultural advisor okay. because these people knew nothing about our people so I had to do like a, a cultural awareness uh, before we start what to mm -hmm. watch for what not to say and and uh, <clears throat> and that became uh, very uh, I guess rewarding because you're you have so many people relying on you. Um, at a given time, I think I had about maybe 60 or 70 volunteers from different places and different projects. And uh, to visit them and make sure they have no issues. Uh, I was like, I sometimes leave midnight to go to a place, you know, six hours away because there was an inc incident. And uh, no matter how cold it was, I'd be... You know, on the roads, colder than this. Yeah. Sometimes heading to Northwest Territories and on by truck was very uh, stressful because uh, forty below out there, the heater can't keep up with uh, the cold, and so uh, yeah, it was you fun want, though. You, you know, want your just, truck to fail too. Yeah, I, I guess it could have. Uh, I just didn't pay much attention in those days. You know, you're young and invincible. You can do it. Right. Yeah. Right. Neat. So you, you became kind of um, almost like an ambassador to a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, a visit. coordinator, yeah. Uh, and at that time, I guess that's when I started worrying about our people, trying to help our right. people, because instead of housing, there were other needs. So I changed the program here in Alberta a little bit where we went into recreation, uh, community development. There's some that did uh, designing uh, houses because we had all kinds of skills. We had uh, architects from Germany. We had plumbers and electricians that were volunteering. So, you know, we put them to work using their expertise. Uh, youth work was a lot, uh, was uh, welcomed in the communities because before that there was nothing. So these people would stay there longer than two months sometimes and, and then they become very, I guess, useful to the communities right. because they were helping them address their, their issues. So that was I did that for another seven years. And what were um, when you said you that's when you really first started to realize um, the issues with um, with Aboriginal people. W what were what became your priorities or the things you saw as needing to be priorities for for your people? It, it was to try to help them. Uh, it was always uh, from that point on because my mom was always uh, after I think nineteen sixty where she. She had health health issues, so she had to. She got to speak the English language really well, you know. From as a kid, she was in the hospital right till in the sixties, and when she was uh, in her thirties, she would uh, be the spokesman for the community because nobody else was educated. You know, they had residential schools, but they ended at grade nine, so very few people went beyond that, and and so the leaders were all uneducated and. Uh, so she became like a spokesperson, uh, community development person. She, uh, she was the government people were scared of her, but you know there was no reason because she was, she was only speaking for her community. That's what she was. It wasn't a personal thing for her, but trying to make things better for the community. Right. 
So she, she, I guess, was kind of a role model for you. She'd be one of your mentors. Well, I'll always be, uh, you know, thinking about that uh, quite a bit. Uh, she died five years ago, but uh, I was wondering where this drive came from because ever since that first job with recreation where I started working with my people, I was always trying to find something, uh, trying to find a better way of life or help them get to a better way of life. After the Frontiers job, I worked with an organization that worked in the courts. And that's where I saw lots of problems uh, with our people. And so I became interested in helping them change their life around. Okay. And so that became my goal. But it's all because of what my mom, I learned right. from my mom. That's where I got the drive from. And what were some of those problems that you started seeing? Uh, alcohol alcohol and drugs and um, dysfunctional families uh, all associated with uh, residential school experiences or uh, people that uh, were uh, went, were brought up uh, in a residential school they didn't have the skills you know their parents had skills that they got from their parents well if you're spending nine years of your life in, in a residential school there's no opportunity for the parents to pass on those skills so those are the ones that were suffering and then their children uh, as well it just never stops so you go to court and you see these guys they're not criminals yet they were the brand of a criminal and it became more important for me then to work with them try to get them to change their life around working with other agencies and uh, it wasn't my role i was told by the people i worked for my goal was to bring stats so that the funding would continue. Right. But I wanted to do more. And from there, I developed different programs. Okay. One was an elders counseling group that did, uh, instead of being sentenced by the court, the judge sent the kids to this group of elders. And we started that in 1990. That became one of the, the greatest achievements, I guess, because those elders, they stuck to the the idea of working with the community till they started passing away one after the other. There's still one left of the original group and she's in the home. Now I'm working with her, with their, their children of those people. But after that, we also formed, a, organized, a, or developed a young offender camp in the community of Wabiska. And I was instrumental in doing that. and. After I left the organization, Native Counseling Services, I worked for the band again and uh, negotiated the camp with the provincial government. And we ran, uh, I think it was an eight-bed facility. And I went to the to the EYOC, which is the, the place where they keep offenders, youth, young offender center. And I interviewed the kids and I, I picked the ones that are related to our community. So there's about five or six different communities where our people were coming from, and that's where I'd go, I'd go no matter what the record was. These weren't really dangerous kids. It's mostly involved with petty theft, uh, mischief, uh, but they, over a period of time, they built up the record. So they get sent to a facility, and those, those are the ones I brought back to the community. And uh, it was successful, and I... I did that for two years and then uh, let somebody else run it after that. And how did you uh, eventually get back into the oil business, I guess, with Larry Cena? Well, after I left, most of my main jobs were seven years. But in between there, I got into something else. And this, this time I was uh, involved in a, like a healing center in another community. I was, I was asked to take over the program. Uh, it was from the uh, Aboriginal Healing Foundation. Again, there was a, a fund in there. So I ran that for a year and then I quit and I went back to Wabiska and worked at a job working with uh, industry, but uh, in a smaller scale. And then the band uh, position came up to be a consultation manager. That's Big Stone Cree Nation. So... Uh, I expressed my interest and they hired me without an interview, basically. So I left from one job to the other and I guess in the in the four years I was with the band, I was really uh, interested in, in 
in the oil business, uh, all the oil companies had to come through my door in order to start to work. They had to come through me and my staff. And so one of the main ones that I initially worked with was Shell. They had a big, big, uh, large property there that they purchased and they were doing the initial work. So they worked with our community and I made sure that our people understood what they were doing. And I got everybody involved. We, you know, we looked at economic development. Uh, we worked with trappers who, who were impacted by the work. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, that Laracina came along maybe two years later. They started in 2006 and, uh, they came there with uh, the VP now, uh, Derek Keller, and a couple other people, and the consultant. Uh, and we had our first meeting. And uh, right away from from the way Derek Keller was, uh, you know, talking and how he wanted to work with the community, I was really impressed. And uh, shortly after that, uh, like a year later, a year or so later, I uh, decided I wanted to leave the band and uh, for personal reasons. And Derek called me and asked if I'd be interested in working. And, uh, I, you know, he'd rather have me there working with industry, but he, if I was going to leave, he'd rather he wanted to hire me. And his, he still didn't know what he wanted to do with me. So he still had to go meet with Glenn. And, uh, and I think when he came back uh, in the new year, this was like in late fall, in the new year, he called me and and filled me in on what he had in mind, which is to be a community engagement, be in community engagement, and uh, work with the community and make sure they understood what uh, the company was doing. And uh, that's how I got involved with Laracina, and I was there for eight years. Okay. And uh, before the interview, we, you had mentioned kind of what what you thought of the oil sands industry before you ever got into it and what you realized they were afterwards. Can you talk a bit about that difference or, or your thoughts? Well, I, I was more, more or less uh, not really paying much attention because all I saw when I was working in the rigs is the conventional oil where you're drilling for oil and dirty work and you know, the rest of it, like the completion parties, you see the, the pump jacks. I wasn't really involved in anything beyond that. Uh, pipelines, I wasn't involved with. I was aware of them. Um, but uh, sort of I, I knew that uh, when I started working with the band in 2004, I knew that there was a whole bunch of oil activity in our area. A lot of... Uh, because of the uh, the traffic in the winter time, and uh, and become aware of the Alberta's uh, consultation uh, policy, uh, the the guidelines and stuff that were that were uh, that were being used, and how First Nations were were sort of gathering force against those provincial guidelines and the policy. And uh, that was around 2008, 2009. So when I was working with Laracina, all this was happening. Uh, when I left the band, uh, the band was not really that involved with uh, with 3D8, who was sort of spearheading all this this issue with uh, going fighting the against the policies, uh, the guidelines, uh, consultation guidelines. And I and I, my feeling was well. I think if you wanted to change, uh, you should be involved. You should work with the government and try to come up with something that fits what the First Nations wanted. But I didn't see that happening. So with, when I started working with Laracina, it was I had to deal with that issue. And uh, and like I said before, I was dealing, I was working with uh, Derek Keller, who was very very supportive and would not proceed with the project until the community was well aware. And um, I think that's where my role was. Okay. And, uh, and did you ever have a, I mean, I assume at some parts it must have been tough to 
get the full support of a community? Yes, uh, it was. Uh, the band was going through a lot of changes with their consultation office. I, I started. I continued advising them. Uh, you know, uh, they always knew what was coming because I was a source. Larry Cena would never keep anything quiet. And they supported the idea of me, you know, if there's something coming up, or if I hear something that another company is doing, I will relay that to the to the to the band, and uh, always keeping in mind that you know our goal is to make sure that there is no uh, that that we make we make sure that the community is aware of everything is happening. We know some of them were not going to be supportive of what we do. We, we can never get everybody to support it. But I guess the main thing is, uh, it doesn't matter about project being delayed. What matters most was the community understands what's happening. And that our role, our, our way of extracting the resource was different than what they read in Fort McMurray, about Fort McMurray, where the mining is, you know, as opposed to drilling. And... Uh, well, I've seen it was all drilling? Yeah. Okay. And, and reusing the water. And, uh, all these tailing ponds, all the negative stuff that was coming from Fort McMurray, in the news all the time, uh, was a lot of these people don't understand. Um, some of them, all they hear is what's on TV. So they think that's what we were doing as well. And it, it was my role, and I spoke to them in their language, in their, my, my first language, and uh, so that I'd have sessions in my office and say, come and see the maps of what we're doing. Any trapper that wanted to uh, they were after compensation, of course, but they first we made sure they understood what was happening, and then we explained that to them in Crete. So all that was was different than than what anybody else was doing, and I guess that's the success that Larissina had there is that they had an office right in the community. Mm -hmm. The only company that did that out of maybe fifteen, twenty companies, some had offices in Slave Lake or Athabasca, but. Larusino was the first and only one to have an office in the community. Okay. Yeah. And how, um, I guess, with with your jobs in the band and stuff, that's obvious um, that um, Aboriginal people were quite present, but um, maybe when you were roughnecking and at Larusina later on, how present or absent um, were Indigenous people at work? And has that changed? Or? Uh, with the with the rigs, um, I worked with uh, an Aboriginal crew, and uh, you know, the the bosses were all non-Aboriginal, but uh, like the, the guys that did the actual work were all pretty well as brothers. Uh, you know, the oldest brother had the most experience. He he was uh, the what do they call them? A foreman, or? Yeah, it's, some, it's a different word. Is a foreman, but his brother, other brother, was a motorman who was a second oh, in charge, okay. and then the driller, uh, the the driller was uh, the derrick man was another yeah. brother, and uh, the guys I worked with the guys on the floor. They did the dirty work. Okay. So that's what I did, and they um, again, like I said, they would explain to me why we were doing this, and when I asked, they'll say, "Well, because I told you to." why I was doing this. Uh, it, I was getting nowhere. I think I, if they had been more willing to share what they knew, I would have been involved in that business a lot sooner. Right. And what about at La Racina? How was the, how present or absent were uh, Aboriginals there? Uh, actually, when we first started, there wasn't very many. But La Racina's uh, policy is to hire local contractors. So although, um, like for the main part of the work, like the exploration, they had the crews uh, that did the work and um, they'd come in. But any kind of work, like with the construction, they used, I said, they used local, local contractors. And that was the main thing that uh, Larissina was very proud of is because we did not bring in uh, equipment from Slave Lake, or unless there was nothing there, and uh, that's that's what I think set us apart from other people because we didn't we worked with what was there, right? And uh, if it wasn't there, then we we sort of expanded. There's a circle 
there's nothing in that circle. We went beyond the circle, which is the next level, like Slave Lake, Athabasca, sometimes Edmonton. But uh, a lot of them were, um, that are already, already in the area. And, but for construction, road construction, there was about four or five main contractors that did that, that have been doing that for years. It's all Aboriginal owned, some of them First Nations owned. Okay. So it was, uh, it fit in quite well. But um, the other thing that we did was because power engineering was one of the main trades that was used in the, in the oil sands, uh, for, for us anyway, power engineering, uh, we started encouraging power engineering and other jobs like uh, electrical and uh, uh, whatever else, uh, working in camps as well. We started promoting that in the community, so there was local contractors that were getting into that. And I think uh, in the f seven years, we had uh, about four people that went for their power engineering in fourth class. And one of them went into and became third class, but we were, f by then, the Arsena was slowing down and shutting down. So that person uh, did his third, finished his third class, uh, but uh, he's now, you know, not doing that work because there's no work right now. Mm. So we were into the schools, encouraging people to go into uh, the oil industry. Um, that's sort of what we promoted uh, through the college as well. We tried to encourage them to bring in trades that would employ our people in the, uh, in the oil field. Right. And, but as we know, yeah, the, the mining, mining and oil uh, sector is always very cyclical, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Always some good times and some bad times. That's right. Um, have you seen a change since, um, since I guess, Laracena and, and industry within your community has really integrated? And have, have you seen a difference with, um, you mentioned at the beginning, a lot of like drug abuse, alcohol abuse. Do you, have you seen, and all your work at the band, has that gotten better or? Um, no. Um, and I think if there was work and more opportunities local level, there would be less alcohol abuse. And as everywhere else uh, in the news, you hear of increase in crime and, you know, family violence uh, as a result of the slowdown. It's the same there. But ours involves a lot of alcohol, alcohol abuse, uh, a lot of drug abuse, a lot of drugs coming in. And uh, I, I guess in a way, if Laracino was still around, uh, the next thing we would have been doing is looking at how can we help. If our, our jobs were increasing this activity because of the extra money in a community, how can we help the social service agencies uh, to uh, battle the, the, these problems. And unfortunately, we're just starting to get into that when, you know, the bottom fell out and there was no more, no more work. Right. But the thing that uh, everybody talks about is that there, there's been, there's a big loss in the community since Laracina shut down the office uh, because they come to us for everything, information about other companies. I always had maps of what other activities happening around Laracena projects and people would be there every day wanting to know more. And we started community awareness uh, there. I also did community awareness programs with uh, like cultural awareness actually uh, for the company. So I was performing two roles, one working with the community, informing them what was happening and how they can be involved and and then again, uh, educating the company about our culture, and that was very well received. Uh, th throughout your your career, I'm sure you had a few, but do you have an example of um, of one of your most difficult or challenging projects? Um, I would say there's, I guess there's challenges in every, in every one. Uh, the one that I, with the company, um, we, 
the company decided to build a pipeline from our project to Fort McMurray area. So our job was to consult with all the impacted people, trappers and across the river, you're heading into other, other territory of First Nations. And uh, I guess the difficulty that I had was trying to uh, work with people the way Narasina worked with Big Stone. And you already had a different process there. There was no, there was no bending from that. Uh, it, it, money talks, you pay so much for a consultation. I think it was like something like uh, thirty or forty thousand dollars to become a member. And then Narasino was only there for a certain time, so you know they wouldn't budge from that. And I, I had to let the, the company deal with it because I wasn't in no position to be negotiating money, it wasn't my role. My role is to show them, to tell them what was happening, make sure that the impacted land users were aware of what was happening and and all that. Uh, I guess it was difficult on my part because there were so many issues that I couldn't address. Um, mm. Mainly it was money that these people wanted and I, and I couldn't, uh, I wouldn't even go there because that's not my role. Right. My role is to make people understand what was happening and and I think uh, for the Wabaska part, everything that I did, I involved the, the consultation office and the trappers who were impacted the most by the project. Thank you. Um, different uh, segment here. This, this are more opinion questions. Uh, first one is, do you believe there's a disconnect between the natural resource industries and um, Aboriginal people? And then I'll ask the same thing for all of Canada as well. Yeah. Um, there is a disconnect. Um, and we, I think we addressed that as much as we could when I was with Laracina. The company, they, they were aware of what the issues are in the community through, through my work. Uh, and also they were able to uh, um, address whatever issues the community had. The chief and council, if they wanted a meeting, well, Derek and Glenn would be there. And and uh, the part that I didn't really appreciate was I, I wasn't invited. They wanted uh, the head people, and I think Laracina wanted me there, but, you know, the leadership said we want to meet with the, the, the decision makers. So that was... Uh, they became, I think, most First Nations became more interested in in, in the economic part, um, the money, um, wanting partnerships, you know, but they wanted money, and I, that wasn't that wasn't my role. Uh, the disconnect is that a lot of them were, a lot of companies were not signing agreements, but they were sort of funneling money into the community. Uh, as far as uh, the other, there's a disconnect um, mainly because, um, in my opinion, there's a lot of anti-oil and gas, uh, and anti-pipeline. And even now, to this day, I'm still uh, promoting um, working with oil companies, even pipelines. You know, there's all, all kinds of opportunities for communities to get into, to work with pipeline companies, uh, work out agreements. And I didn't see that happening. And I, I noticed uh, going to the, listening to the news and watching what happened at Standing Standing Rock in, in uh, North Dakota, the, uh, there was an opportunity to negotiate but, and I think maybe some oil companies like that, they, they allow ignorance and arrogance to, to lead the way. There was no compromise. There was no working with the First Nations, especially in, uh, in the States. In, in here, it's changing here in Canada because every community now has their own, every First Nation has their own traditional area. And the governments have been very supportive of helping them protect or at least so that they're ensuring that there's meaningful uh, consultation 
and trying to work out some kind of uh, an agreement with with the First Nations in in uh, with Standing Rock. They they just left it, let it go too long. You know, um, there, the oil company they were funded by three Canadian banks, and everybody knows that. They were pushing for his oil through Indian lands, and there was a block blockade there. So, first question I had when they started: Why not negotiate? Go around. Now the plan is to go around. You know, like spending what three months uh, wasting time. All the actors coming in there, all the you know servicemen uh, that came there to to support. Uh, before that happened, they, this should have been settled. And that's what we were saying. Friends of mine are still in the business. They, they talk about the pipelines. They know that we're facing problems in BC. Uh, how the, uh, the bans are against, and all the environmental groups are supporting them. And, and I think, um, I still think that they could have negotiated the, uh, some kind of arrangement. Uh, if I'm going to be fighting for the environment, uh, you know, my, my traditional area where I hunt and I gather and I trap or where the animals are, the habitats and stuff, I'd want to be involved in what was happening. So I'd want the government to pay for my involvement somehow, maybe train people or start businesses where they monitor the pipeline or little things like that would go a long way. And some of the companies that I talked to were, were going into that. Um, but there's still going to be people that will be against this uh, this pipeline. That's my phone. Uh, and uh, I see that, uh, and my role is different now, So, but I'm still always going to be a supporter of what Larsina did. You know, they, they uh, they started, they changed consultation. Uh, and uh, for the company, that, that that that's what sold me with that company. Is they, they weren't they weren't there. They you know they what they didn't know they wanted to learn, and that's the key. And that's what has to be done with our First Nations. Is uh, they're not always going to be against, but they just want to be a part. Right. And I think that would uh, address a lot of the social problems. Uh, maybe get bands more uh, more into business. Uh, like, you know, you talked about Jim Boucher up in Fort McMurray. He's got a good uh, good business sense, and he's really done a lot for for the band. And uh, I think he's a leader in the, in in that area with working with industry. And he he works with industry. He doesn't. Uh, block or you know he he knows what's best uh, and he also knows I don't know uh, how much can be done but there's a lot of land on reserve that's being destroyed by the oil company and and I and in our, in our community uh, the the impact is different and and that's what Larissina promoted is that the impact could be minimal but uh, we, what we promoted was well show us how we can share the land. We're not taking it over. And, and Larsina did a lot to work with the trappers. You know, we, we built one guy a, a, a cabin and we built roads for people. We helped them with access roads and different activities like that that we helped with. Uh, if they needed a road graded to their trap line cabin, or if we had equipment there, we, we plowed the road in through. And uh, that has to be done. And there's still, you know, the impact is small. They can still trap in that area, um, but they they respect they respect that. Yeah. So it's all about involving them in a business sense, and and it's about communication and yeah. transparency too. Yeah. And uh, what I said about arrogance and uh, ignorance uh, that might be the same. I think in some cases with our first with our oil companies and that come to our area, the. Uh, they don't, like I said, they don't have an office in the community, so they they just go by, uh, you know, they try their meetings with the band, and, and a lot of times uh, they don't 
they're not in good terms with the band. And I, I noticed that uh, I still work with the band in the same same building, so I see them coming and going. Some of them I remember from when I was at Laracina, and they're coming there and they're not getting very far. And um, you know, I think that has to change. Uh, Laracina started something I think uh, should be continued by all the companies. They should show more presence in that community, be a part of the community. Um, last question here, and then I'll finish with a few closing questions. How do you see the future of Canada's re uh, resources? And when I say resources, I talk about its its environment, the environment, and its relationship with its people and industry. Are we on the right track or not? I think um, mostly it, it, Canada has the right idea. Uh, the Alberta government is, you know, started off in the wrong foot. And but they're now sort of backtracking, and uh, I, I I know that uh, Prime Minister is getting a lot of flack from some of the anti. Uh, some of my friends uh, are anti pipeline, uh, anti oil sands, and I just don't think we'll ever be able to go back to the horse and wagon. So how are they gonna? You know they are they gonna? Uh, continue, uh, is Canada to continue buying oil from the States and Saudi Arabia? Um, uh, you know, while we have so much oil that we can, you know, bring up in, in our, in our, in the North, Northern Alberta, they, what they want is for the oil to stay in there. And, and they don't consider what, what, um, that, has what impact that has on our economy, uh, and the number of people that are that are, you know went to school to get into oil and gas are no longer able to work, and uh, there I think there's a way to to sure worry about the carbon, uh, worry about global warming, but you don't just stop industry just just to address that issue. You can always Technology is always improving. You know, oil sand, oil spills, uh, pipeline breaks are addressed immediately. So that area has to, I think that's where the focus has to be with industry is to make sure that each spill, they learn something from that. And I think they do. But in this oil companies, I mean, communities and environmental groups don't care about that. They, 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 they preach to our First Nations about what can happen if there's a spill, you know, what, how much harm it can do to their water, to the environment in general. And like I said before, our First Nations should be involved in monitoring. You know, our First Nations should be taught how to be, uh, how to be first on call for oil spills, how to be involved directly. And I, I really think that's the answer there. Um, you can never prevent spills or accidents. But as long as our people are involved right from the start, and that's what we tried to do with Laracina. I get a call if there was something serious happening three in the morning sometimes, and I'd call my contact. So the process starts right there. But this was towards the end of Laracina in the community. This was what we were doing. And uh, if they were doing something, uh, even for another company, if they're near our, our camps, to make sure we know about it for safety reasons. If they're coming through our gate, let us know where you're going. We don't care why, but so we know where you're at, so our safety people can know if you get into an accident. And that happened, and they didn't tell us. And, uh, you know, nothing major, but some, some people were left out in the cold overnight because they didn't tell us where they were going. They just went right through, and so, there's things like that. Um, I think um, that's one thing that uh, Laracina brought is their safety is the main concern, but also involving the community in everything that they did. Right. Um, A few last closing questions. Um, first one is, what are you proudest of in life or professionally? I think the, the last eight years of my work in career with Laracina uh, that 
I think has to be the highlight. Uh, I wish I started that first. I probably would have still been in the business, but in those days there was no such thing as consultation in the, in the 70s when I started work. Uh, but now with uh, the way Laracino operated, it really fit my goals. And, and the, when I told it, when I asked, the leadership asked me why I left, I said I thought I could do more for this community working with an oil company. And that's what kept me going because the company really wanted that as well. They wanted to make sure that our community benefit benefited from that. And Glenn has said that a number of times. We're there for a short time. The community lives there, has lived there forever. And they'll still be there when we're gone. Like, we don't want to create an impact that's going to be negative. Like, they want to leave something behind that's positive. And I really think they did. And last question, what are the, sorry, if you were to, if you were to talk to someone much younger, like a, like a child or a student, what would be the most important life lesson or piece of advice you'd give them looking forward? Um, well, there'd be a number, number of them. One of them is to make sure they understand, you know, an Aboriginal person, especially what, uh, what our traditional lands are about, you know, what are, what our people did on that land and how much of it can we learn from, from this history? How much of that can we learn from as we go forward? And, and how can we, uh, I guess maybe not live in two worlds, but you're, you're trying to uh, get a career, trying to decide what career you want to go into, uh, you know, from high school. I, I'd still say uh, go into oil and gas. It's here for long term. But also make sure you understand what our, what our people were here for, that our people were when they were, um, we hear a lot of elders say our role was to be keepers of the land, keepers of the animals. The, the Creator gave us these animals to, to eat and to, for shelter, uh, clothing. It's up to us to, to manage that. And I really believe that because, you know, the way it is now, people are don't really see that. Um, they see, um, like the environment, um, they don't go. They don't go in a bush anymore. Our role as teachers now, I have elders working with me, is uh, now that I'm working in justice. It's just sort of a little different. Uh, in a way, it, my role is the same though, more like an agent of change. You know, I want to uh, make sure these people understand what it was like to live in the bush, how do, how do you track an animal, how do you prepare a snare, you know, how do you start a fire safely in the bush, how do you, uh, how do you survive in the bush. All these things are being taught by our elders now. And so what I'm doing is working with uh, people that are getting into tr trouble with the law. Uh, part of their sentence might be, well, you're going to go with the trapper, you know, in a bush for, you know, two or three trips or a week long camp or or maybe it go help this elder fish. You know, he's getting older, so you will be helping him. And in the winter it's a lot of work. So out of it you get to the experience and you bring home fish for your family. And the then the judge and the prosecutor are sort of looking at these as, well, we're not doing much good in the with our justice system. You know, every year uh, there's more Aboriginal people in, in going to the court and into jail. There's a, a big population uh, of Aboriginal people in jails. The the judge says, and I and I'm there most of the court days. At the start of the session, he'll say, "There's something wrong here." You know, 80% of the cases before me, you guys, it's all alcohol related. You know, there's 10. 10 cases of impaired driving. He said, when are you going to change? And these guys, are they keep, keep coming back. They keep going to jail now because it's their second or third offense. So my role then is, well, it may be with this new job, 
It may be this person's third offense, but it's not doing him any good to go spend 30 days in, in Fort Saskatchewan. How about if he did something more productive here in the community? Go and count, go into counseling, you know, work going with his family, with his wife to counseling, doing something in the bush. And uh, the elders say it's a healing. It's a very important, it's very important to he uh, part of healing to go back to doing some of these things. You no know, trapping will never be in the industry anymore. But it's a, it's a way. It's a treaty right. Our people did that from as far back as anybody can remember. And uh, it it's got a healing quality. You're, you're doing something in the land, and and that's what these elders are. Are preaching everywhere I read, in Northwest Territories in Fort Good Hope, for example, they have uh, the same thing. They take uh, people that are involved in drugs and alcohol. Uh, they're taking them out in the bush, teaching them all these life skills. Um, so in the Yukon, uh, they had a canoe trip that was eight weeks to ten days long, from one community to Dawson City, I think, and. It's like a traditional canoe, a big canoe, and they, they lived off the land, and all these things are happening, and that's what we're shooting towards in our community as well. And and I really, am, we're starting to get a lot of support. The, the police supported, the uh, prosecutor is very interested in, in doing something, and, and the judge, and uh, and our people are at a point where they, they really need help, and and relying on Big Stone Cree Nation to to uh, to provide the answers, and that is what we're trying to do. I think, yeah, I think the bush works a neat idea. Yeah, I think it's. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, we missed. I think uh, you know the professional organizations that I'm, I've been involved yeah. with. Uh, Again, it was always involving Aboriginal people. In there was a time where I was on a board for Children's Services uh, Provincial. Uh, we we were a regional board, and uh, that was very uh, rewarding because you know we had we worked with social workers and people that worked with Aboriginal people, and we were through the board. We were able to help uh, help the, the region, I guess. Because they did everything with foster care and and uh, you know dealing with people that are on social assistance and stuff like that, uh, where where it involves the family, and then also right now I'm with a board called Six Medicine Lodge. It's a treatment for youth, and it's at uh, just outside Calgary in the First Nation, and I've uh, been on been with them for oh, five years now. And very rewarding because everything they do is what I'm doing over here in Wabiska. Um, although I don't only work with youth, but I've sent two youth to that facility from from there that were getting into trouble, and uh, so far they're doing good. And I'll continue doing that, and I'll continue being a part of uh, you know organizations like that because I think I have. Well, they think I have some to offer from my life experiences. And they seem quite rewarding as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you see the, the reports and, you know, the, I attended one graduation and I couldn't believe the difference with the, with the girls. I went to a girl's graduation after four months. They came there rough, uh, you know, dressed rough and all gang style, uh, drugs and alcohol and and then four months later, you see them in gowns and, you know, where they're making presentations uh, in front of a group of people, family. That's the most rewarding part, you know, seeing That's that. a great feeling. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Well, I hope I did something, said something that you can use. It was great. Mm -hmm.